welcome to Pegging Coffee Talk. Here are your hosts, Lady Alba and Lord Knight. Oh my goodness. We're going to talk about our Satan friends. Satanists. Are Satanists pagan? I don't think so. Really? No. Would they not be Christian? Hmm. Or some form of Christianity? I think it depends on whether or not they view Satan as Baphomet or not. Or do they worship him as the morning star? Right. The bringer of knowledge Mm -hmm. and light. Okay, so here's the thing. I think they're pagans in the sense that they're fringe. Yeah. And in the sense that they have rejected the traditional ideology. Well, I mean, we, we are talking about the church mm-hmm. that. Well, there's two different ones, as you right, well know. OK, so there <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> so I remember reading Anton LaVey's Satanic Bible way back in the day. Um, I think I bought it in high school, mainly because I wanted to scare my parents. Which a lot of us did, by the way. Um, and uh, and it was funny because, again, there was no Amazon. You had to physically go to a bookstore. You had to be checked out at a counter. You had to have somebody look at the back of that book and look up at you and go, seriously? Seriously? Yeah. Okay. So, so and, um, and, and then give you that speech. So the best place uh, to put this so your parents will find it and yeah. freak out the most yeah. is. <laughs> yeah. Just leave it on the kitchen counter. Just right by their keys. So Anton LaVey, no, Anton LaVey was not a pagan. You agree? Okay, the dog agrees. Anton LaVey was not a pagan. (laughs) Um, As the founder of the satanic church, he created the anti-Christian mass. Yeah. Yes. So you're right. Um... Their, their their philosophies and everything are based off the Christianity, mm-hmm. but the opposite the majority of the time, I think. Uh, it's not even so much it's opposite. Not opposite it's either. really the belief that, okay, because this is where, right, philosophically we can really oh, get into some interesting rabbit holes with Christianity. It was the belief that the archangels all the angels really right we're we're all son of god we're all his offspring right okay and that there is the hierarchy that exists angelically and satan the morning star right right samael was his angelic name was god's favorite he defied god and then we know the rest of the story god cast him out of heaven so the thought process with Anton LaVey was he had to be his favorite for a reason. And if we look at the fact that Jesus was his favorite as well, right, is chosen on earth. Right. But he killed him. He sacrificed him. Did he not basically do the same with Lucifer by casting him out? Did he not sacrifice his son for something else? Now, does this start to go along the lines of like the uh, TV show Lucifer that he was really down there just to no. be in charge? No, that not this at really all. It really wasn't a battle that, that uh-uh. somebody had to take up this position. No, Lucifer, the, the TV show, albeit quite good. Uh, yeah. Um, no. It, I, I just mean the concept, not the actual show. <laughs> very few. Some of it. They overlapped a little bit. Right. Like one of the, the biggest things was how he couldn't tell a lie. You know, anytime someone accused Lucifer of being a liar, he would get very upset because he would say, I don't lie. Um, That was supposed to be one of the major things with the Morning Star was that, yeah, he 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 didn't lie. That's the whole point. That's why he got cast out in the first place. So anyway. Yeah. So Anton LaVey created a structure around that and created this church. Anton LaVey was also a star fucker. (laughs) <laughs> who was in Hollywood, right, in the 50s yeah. and the 60s, and who wanted to create a sort of cult slash religion slash, you know, he was on the same train as a Scientology guy, right? Like, yeah. let me make something that's going to make money. Yes. 
very fanciful storytelling, very interesting. Okay. The Church of Satan that we know of today is actually a political organization. Right. It is less about the religion and more about the politics and more about these quote unquote radical views that really aren't that radical if you look at them. They operate as a church because legally they can. And they've taken up, you know, all of the 501c3 ranks and they've done due diligence to register with the government and all of these things and they accept donations and blah, blah, blah. But I don't believe that they actually have like a church. Like there's no get togethers. There's no meetings. Like I think it's all very much like sort of an online presence. Right. And if they do get together, it's more of like a meeting than a religious ceremony. Yeah. And they do things that are, uh, they do things specifically to piss people off because they want to make their voice heard. You know, they are the ones who put this giant bronze statue. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. Of Lucifer, <laughs> Baphomet, basically, Baphomet. with children at his feet. It's in Little Rock, Arkansas at the Capitol. It's hysterical. I think that is the funniest thing ever. <coughs> and if and they couldn't be stopped because it's a real it, like yeah, it's, it, it's hysterical. So they found a loophole, you know, basically. Right. They're like, if you can erect a statue of Jesus, we can do this. Brilliant. So I see them as being more pagan than what Anton LaVey came up with. And I I, I can see that. Yeah. But have you noticed there aren't Satanists anymore? Like, no. not really. Like, it used to be, I feel I, like... There, every, there, there's still a few yeah, out there. I don't... I just don't feel like I see them anymore. Like, I feel like when I was growing up, there they were more apparent. There were kids and young adults who were very clearly into this idea of Satanism or even even more demonology, yeah. right, than, than anything else. I feel like many of them have evolved into paganism or they kind of, you know, got absorbed into some other. Well, I mean, I, I know belief. I don't know. I know growing up a few mm -hmm. guys I used to hang out with, they, they seem to have started off in Satanism and now over the years, they've yeah. moved more closer to paganism or. Yeah. And that's what I mean. I think it was a lot of it back then was to shock people. It was to be. It was to piss off your parents. And then the other piece of it was uh, it, it, <laughs> there was literally a component of it that, you know, because there were all these weird things in the media about how cults were moving into the suburbs and you know, the Satanists <laughs> next door. Right. So people yeah. were just like, yeah, you know what? I'm going to be that person. Yeah. Just just to do it. Just to do it. Yeah. Um, I, I, and then, am, you know, I am sitting that black altar up yeah, in my backyard. And, you know, <laughs> death metal got on board and, you know, you had a music movement that came with it. So it, but I never took any of it very seriously. I really didn't. I just sort of saw it and went, okay. Well, I don't think we took it as seriously as some mm. of the Christian community mm. did back in the day. Mm -hmm. For sure. You know, For we sure. were like, okay, really? The Christians were, I mean, there's no, they were, oh my God, they but were now, livid. Now, they now, were livid. Thinking back with what you know now, mm -hmm. how many of them groups did they, did they actually say were Satanists and blah, 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 all were them. actually, were actually pagan. really pagan? Yes. All of them. All of them. Because the minute somebody, it, again, Anton LaVey, right. the minute he started using an upside down pentagram, it was on. It was on. Prior to LaVey. The question really is, was the upside down pentagram even associated with anything satanic? I don't know that it was. I, I don't. The, the only way I know the upside down pentagram being used is a symbol for second degree. It's male. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. It's the ma it's the symbol for man. man. So, yeah, I don't get yeah. it. I don't, but I mean, again, I wasn't alive. So how the hell can I, even, I don't know. And I don't, and shit. I mean, now that I come to think of it, none of our elders who were around back then are still with us that they would have been able to tell us, but I don't think so. I don't think it had any associates. I think it, it was around that time 
again, 50s, 60s, it was associated with, and it stuck. And it stuck. And there's yeah. no way around it. No, and it sucks because we're going to be dealing with that for a long time. Mm-hmm. And it's annoying. <laughs> And then there are the people who still continue to do it because they just think it's metal. <laughs> and I'm like, knock it off. <laughs> no. You know, but again, it, it's sort of worn off. Again, it's, it's been used. It has. It, it's been screamed at the top of the lung 50 times of, oh, the Satanists are coming. Do we have any Satanist listeners? Like, are you out there? Mm-hmm. Do you want to come on the show? I would love to talk to you. Seriously, not for any other reason than I'm curious. I mean, because the way I sort of look at them is they have Christian overtones, but they mm-hmm. also have pagan ties right. there. Right. So they're the sort of. I would absolutely love their perspective. Like, OK, I have sat in Marie Laveau's voodoo yeah. it shop in New Orleans. So I felt so bad for the guy working that day because they have a five foot Baphomet in the middle of the store. Massive. OK. And it's an altar. Uh People leave money, they leave tokens, they leave cigarettes, you know, they leave all kinds of things. And this woman who was very irate, right? She was like, why is the devil in here? And this kid behind the counter, like, it was so funny because he literally went, that is not the devil. That is Baphomet. Baphomet is a symbol used throughout the pagan world, and most specifically in our case, in voodoo and voodoo religions. <sighs> He's a symbol of transformation. I mean, it yeah. was like he was reading mm-hmm. off of a script yeah. that was taped behind the counter. That I have said so many times, yes. I have it memorized. Yes, <laughs> he, you could just see the he glossed over, right? Like his <laughs> eyes, just like he went away. And this woman is, of course, well, it looks like the devil to me. Well, it looks like the devil to you, ma'am, because that is the figure that traditionally has been scapegoated, no pun intended, throughout <laughs> the Christian community to represent the demon known as the devil with the hooved feet and the horns. But in other cultures, he is not regarded this way. <laughs> it's just so funny. But they but, you know, but that happens all the time. Right. Baphomet. Go yeah, like it was, woof, there's no going back. What? And everybody is always going to associate Baphomet with the devil. Yes. I no think we're, we're kind of screwed there. Yeah. Um, it's done. It's over with. This yeah. lot's been died. Yeah. But I would love to know where the Satanist community feels on the, like, how do they even feel about it? Do they even recognize Baphomet? They be, they might be like, screw that guy. We don't even, he's got nothing to do with anything. Mm. I don't know. I don't know. I'd be really, really, really curious to, uh, to have an open discussion there because I do think if they do consider themselves to be pagan, then even the majority of the pagan community is uneducated. Right. And at odds and needs to have a better understanding of this to understand where and how we can integrate them as a tradition. As a tradition. Yeah. Because how could we not? I think it's fascinating. Oh, man. All Hi. right, Lord Knight, it's winter. Yes, it is. In some places, there's snow falling. Yay. All the snowflakes. Just not here. Not here. <laughs> so... Th- question that i pose for you because we do an awful lot of talk about the snowflakes is is everyone truly unique to be quite honest with you Mm. no (laughs) no you're not as unique (laughs) as you think you are all right is what i'd say what about you (laughs) oh man oh man all right are we talking about spiritually are we talking about Physically, molecularly. I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about your personality, what you like, what you don't no. like. Yeah, I, I come at this from a couple of unique perspectives. Um, so tell you what, why don't you go ahead and handle the science so I don't make an idiot of myself. <laughs> in, in what ways has science proven that we are not all alike? <laughs> Well, again, no two genetic structures are alike. Even twins differ Mm -hmm. to some extent. No two brain waves are alike. No Mm -hmm. two brain structures are alike. Mm -hmm. Again, everyone is an individual, but 
I'm still some form of my parents. Okay. So I, technically, why I have a unique set of genes and a unique set of order, I don't have unique genes. But also, molecularly, we're all the same. Right. We're, we're literally, made. we are literally from the old saying, we are all star stuff. Yeah. Yeah. That's we are made, made of star of. stuff. Yeah. Yes. We are all the fucking same. So. Oh. <laughs> mm. Well, I, again, we mm. like to think we're unique, different individuals, but you wouldn't have country music yeah. if we were. You wouldn't have rock and roll. You wouldn't have rap. Yeah. So. <laughs> advertising is based <laughs> on a couple of scientific precise principles it's literally what the ad world revolves around i know he gave me kisses <laughs> basically it's it's pretty straightforward for as long as ads have been in existence the purpose of advertising has been to put human beings into boxes mm -hmm. and then to exploit said boxes yeah by selling you more of the shit that appeals to the box that you fit in and or making you believe that if you want to be in a different box, you just have to make these purchases to make it happen. Now, today, as advertising has evolved, as media consumption has evolved, right, all of these things have changed tremendously. All that is happening is the number of boxes have gone from five or six choices to, to dozens. But we all still fit in a goddamn box. Yep. There is so much. We talked about this in, in the episode that we did about consumerism and, yeah. and paganism and commercialization. There's so much purchasing happening on social media, on the Internet, ads that are specifically targeting pagans and witches constantly constantly whether it be clothing stores or you know memorabilia or home decor like there's so many companies that do this because now the term witchy right right or, it's, a box. it's a box it's a box that you now fit in for some advertisers it's like getting that first aarp ad mm. when you turn about 49 yeah well now it's like, like 42 two, but yeah yeah and yeah. you're mm -hmm. you know and again I, I heard of one girl that got in trouble with her dad oh no because she received a bunch of coupons and stuff for pregnancy oh shit and they sent it to her based on what she'd been looking up mm. online so the internet knew she was pregnant before gotcha. she did and this is how her dad found out oh god hysterical yeah, the internet knew before her family. Wow. All right. I mean, I've heard for years, Facebook knows when you go poop. It does. I mean, <laughs> but this is what's hysterical. Like, everything. The foods that we like. No matter how unique we believe we are, we there's a scant few individuals who really, really, truly fall into these unique trendsetter boxes. And then... Because of their popularity, everyone else follows and you yourself end up in a damn box. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I think a lot of people want to don't seem to understand this whole entire bell curve thing that mm -hmm. we got going mm -hmm. where the average or the bulk of people are in the center. Yeah. And how few are in the extremes. Yeah. I mean, for a blip in time. Right. I mean, this is one of the more recent examples I can come up with. Being a polyamorous homesteader who was incredibly eco-conscious and recycled everything in their home to the best of their ability, right? Mm -hmm. And only bought used when possible. That was a fringe thing. There were just a small, small group here or there of people who did it. Now it's so popular it's marketed to. Yes. Right. Which then begs the question with certain things like polyamory, were there really that many polyamorous people to begin with? Or did the world, again, media consumption, make polyamory more 
Tolerable. known. Yeah. And, uh, and therefore, palatable. yeah, literally just kind yeah. of went, oh, this is a thing. And how many people went, huh, interesting. And then looked down that rabbit hole and went, oh, I'm polyamorous. OK, well, cool. But that's but but you didn't come to that conclusion by yourself. No. And therein lies the problem. Unique thoughts are just that you've come to it on your own, not because anyone led you or exposed you. You came to it and then brought it to other people's attention. It's rare nowadays. That, that, that's super rare. Mm -hmm. Anybody who plays music knows there's no such thing as an original song anymore. No, I mean, all the notes have been had. They've been composed in a way someone else has composed them before. They might not be identical, but they're close enough. This is how we hear one song and we go, oh, yeah, it kind of sort of no, sounds, sounds like, like this other. Th yeah, because it's been done before. It's not like that artist went out of their way to plagiarize no. the other party. It's just what happens. There's I mean, too many of us. Right. I mean, you've got eight notes. They can only go into so many combinations that eventually there's going to be. Yeah. There's going to be some repeat. Somewhere. Same thing with, you know, writing. I mean, the, the, everything's been done already. Everything's been. It's so rare when we encounter something unique that we're fascinated by it because we're like, holy shit, look at that. Right. That, but, but again, that's what makes it unique. Mm -hmm. That's what makes these things rare is the limited amount well, of them it's like okay i go what star wars came out in 78 79 something like that something like that okay i think i was like nine okay star wars was mind-blowing oh god right yeah this idea of a galaxy that with people and other life form and they had you know, governments and systems. But then, then, and, let me stop you there. Mm. But the story they told was not. Right. The story was for the ages. The story the, was, yeah. The, the story tell. is, is the mm -hmm. most, one of the most universal yes. stories. Yes. But George Lucas created this world, this world that most of us could have never in a million years thought of. No. And, but now look how many Ripoffs? In essence, yeah. ev just about every sci-fi show has in some way borrowed or taken from Star Wars. Well, when you when you get up to the Weird Al Yankovic levels and the space ball levels, <laughs> right, right, right. You, you know you have become a cultural yes, force. Of course, of course. <laughs> but it's just that idea that, yeah, there was one guy who really did bring something original to the table. And everybody else just followed along. Um, yeah, they made their own spin. They came up with their own little unique ways of looking at it. But for the most part, yeah. So I don't, I I think that, hi, the doggo came to say hi. I think that today we just have such a desire, such a want to be unique, to be special, to be different. But yeah, people are just going out of their way to come up with all these titles. And it's well, doing the opposite of what they wanted it to do. Right. And well, I think they're also people are starting to come up with ways to be unique that might not be quite as helpful as they think they are. Well, well, I, I'll give you an example. <sighs> and one woman I heard of keeps on saying she's so special. Her karma seems to wear off on her daughter all the time. Okay. Do you, this is the kind of things I keep on hearing sure. where people are trying to stretch this. The I'm being attacked by a bulldog. Um but, okay, so I look at like the dating scene right now. And I go the sheer volume of people that are like they're in an ethically non-monogamous they're poly they are um an entj for those of you who know what that means the personality type um neurodivergent you know they use all of these terms and i'm like 
There can't be this many of you. It's just not possible. Um, there's something with the personality type test, kind of like in the you know, same vein as like right. an IQ test, you know, that ENTJs or whatever the hell it is, they're supposed to be so unique. They're only 0.2% of the population. Well, why is it that I can open a dating app right now and find a couple thousand of them? Thank that you. shouldn't be possible. No. It's we want to be those things so badly. We want to be different. We want to be special. But, you know, I look at it with kids, right? Nobody raises their child with the idea that I'm raising, you know, a future retail worker. No. You know, you tell your kids they can be anything. You tell them to dream. You tell them to go out for something different than what everybody else is doing. But I do think at the end of the day, most parents are realistic enough to realize, yeah, my kid it might just be a, a garbage. Plumber. Yeah, garbage man, a, you know, an office worker. Like, they're not going to have some incredibly unique existence that's going to make them singular right they're ordinary you know i'm i'm mm. i hate to be this way not everybody can be an astronaut no if if we were all as unique as we claimed or wanted to give the appearance of there would be no one left to run a store no. There would be no one left. I, I, I don't think to there would do infrastructure jobs. I don't think there would be a society because there's not enough to hold us together. No. Why, why should I hang out with you? You're not doing anything I like. Right. Regular is necessary. Average is necessary for existence. I mean. I mean, you want me to sit here and say, yes, you are a unique individual mm -hmm. and all this. Uh, you are. But you want yeah. to sit there and say, "Hey, you know, you're you're a fa you're a football fan just like everybody else. You're a mm -hmm. basketball fan like everybody else. Mm -hmm. You like this band mm -hmm. like everybody else." Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Like, you can think you're as unique as you want until you buy concert tickets to a venue <laughs> and you stand with tens of thousands of other people cheering and clapping for the same thing. Right. I you, mean, you look around and go, "I'm not special." No. I mean, again. I'm a little bit of an oddball. I like the 60s and stuff like yeah, that. But and I'm sitting here going, okay, we're going to go see hair. Oh, we're going to have the whole audit because who's going to go see yeah, hair besides right. me? That place oh, was no. freaking packed. Yeah. And people were in tie dyed and all, and it was more fun. Yes. <laughs> but I think that's it. I think you can be eccentric. You can be smart. You can have interesting or different likes or hobbies or but that doesn't mean you're so singular that we we're going to attach the special label no no it wouldn't make much sense i, I don't think it would mm -mm. and i mean with that it, it's like I don't know what, why, why do we need that so badly? Uh, competition? Mm. I, I don't want to say competition, but I think that there's something in humanity. Generally speaking, we, we want to outdo each other. Well, it's ego. Ego, yeah. So with ego in mind, right, what... What is the evolutionary or the, th the thing drawing us, right, societally to say, oh, I'm different, I'm different, I'm different. That's a construct. I think it's because we li because now we live in a society where everybody's packed in so close together, mm. you can't help but see the similarities. Mm. And everybody, you, you start to realize that you're so similar that trying to break out of that mold. But yet... It becomes almost an obsession. Right. But instead, if we all just accepted that we're different but ordinary, right. we'd be in better shape. But the other thing is, yeah, I mean, from, from, from just an evolutionary standpoint, different is bad. Yes. Different is what makes us judge. Different is what makes us, in many instances... When we start, when we start yeah. looking at these really special people, let, let's, let's look at the, the people that tend to be like super smart. Yeah. The majority of these times when you talk to these people, they have psychological problems mm -hmm. out the yin-yang. Yeah. They're emotional and yeah. 
there's a number of different things happening. Right. And something I find really funny is how many of the people that are truly that singular. Have you noticed they don't procreate? No. Very few. Elon Musk is actually a weirdo. He's an oddball in (laughs) that because he has like 10 children. First of all, I'm like, who are the 10 women that volunteered to sleep with this man? Because he's stark raving nuts. (laughs) I don't know that I could hold a conversation with him long enough to get to the point of taking my pants off. I don't know. I'm just like, I can't wrap my brain around how that happened. But it's the same with Einstein, right? right? Who could have married Einstein? There's no way. But he was married. He was. I don't remember if he had kids or not. But often, yeah, we don't see a lot of that. These people tend to be loners. They stick to themselves. They don't play well with others. Because they hold nothing in common with other people. Yes. So then, which then begs the question, are you seeking uniqueness to be a hermit? Are you seeking uniqueness? So that other people go, ooh, ah, Ah, and inflate that ego. That ego. And that sense of superiority, which is a fallacy anyway. Hmm. All sorts of questions. You know. No answers. I know. But there's always. I mean, look, (laughs) forget the grain of sand, right? The the, I am but a grain of sand on a beach of sand. I would rather be a coffee bean (laughs) in a roaster full of coffee beans. Oh. Yes. Transform me into the thing that makes someone happy and energetic. (laughs) That's all I wish. Yeah. Yep. I am I am but a medium roast in a sea of medium roasts. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, this means you won't coffee. Of course I do. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Join us next week for another episode. Pagan Coffee Talk is brought to you by Life Temple and Seminary. Please visit us at lifetempleseminary.org for more information, as well as links to our social media. Facebook, Discord, Twitter, YouTube, and Reddit. We travel down this trodden path, the maze of stone and mire. Just hold my hand as we pass by a sea of blazing pyres. And so it is the end of our days, so walk with me till morning breaks. And so it is the end of our days, so walk with me till morning breaks.